Please welcome CEO of Azul Brazilian Airlines, John Rogerson, in discussion with aviation advisor and board member of WestJet, Alex Cruz. Good morning, everyone. We got a problem. Problem is lunch is next. Yeah. So we really need to keep everyone uh, super entertained. Um, as I was uh, uh, preparing to, to speak with you today, I thought that about nine years ago in a conference very similar to this one um, with a number of CEOs and industry experts, we went through a, a process of about one hour where the question was, what is the best airline that we could build today together? And through a series of questions and, and surveys, we built one. And the answer was, a low-cost carrier in South America <laughs> that would have code shares <laughs> and interlines and relationships with others. Here we are. So that, that's it. We built it. <laughs> amazing thing. Right. So um, as, as we go along, perhaps a, a couple of things about Azul. Azul started as a, really a true, I don't know if I should use the word true, but uh, as a low-cost carrier, very pure, simple uh, to start with. But then it grew. It began to grow. It began to take on other aircraft types, begin to relate to other airlines. Um, tell me more about that evolution of, of the model, because most people that start in that sort of truest of models, they try, or at least they tend to want to stay there, or many of them do anyways. You know, we found in Brazil, and I think this is, you know, for most part of the world, is that the market is big and diverse, right? And so when we went to Brazil, we saw nobody was flying Embraer aircraft. So aircraft that are manufactured inside the country, you know, there was only about 40 cities served in a country that should have more than 200, you know, cities served. And so we started kind of flying, you know, these Embraer aircraft opened up a lot more cities than our competitors did. And then we said, geez, you know, there's cities of 20 million people in, in Sao Paulo, 13 million in Rio, but there's also cities of 200,000 people that don't have air service. And these are really wealthy cities. And so we diversified again and went down to, you know, turboprop aircraft where people just didn't have access. You know, the road system is very expensive in Brazil. Um, you know, fuel prices are 40% more expensive in Brazil than they are in the U.S. and in Europe. And so, you know, the model adapts. I mean, you, you kind of, I, I think of like In-N-Out Burger. I love In-N-Out Burger, but it's the same thing every time. And you know, I think that works really well for certain individuals. But when we saw the opportunity in Brazil is if we were an In-N-Out Burger, we'd probably be capped out at about 50 aircraft. And today we have 165 aircraft flying to 170 destinations all over Brazil and have become the most profitable airline in South America doing just that. And I think that you know, we diversified ourselves to create more opportunity for our people and for the country where we're trying to develop aviation. That's interesting because in a way when you look at um, super ultra low cost people, indigo partners, et cetera, um, they haven't really focused on Brazil. From a distance, Brazil looks like a populous uh, a country with um, uh, dense population centers, but also some remote secondary airports, et cetera. But there isn't one of those in, in Brazil. Why? Why, why isn't there a, a, a Volaris or a Wizz Air or something like that in, in Brazil? You, you know, because fuel is 40% more expensive, right? And, and you know, the unions have a minimum, minimum salary there. And so, yeah, you know, you can come in with a more densified product than maybe the, the, the local competitors. But there are many attributes to Brazil make it very difficult for ULCC to succeed. And, and the primary one, Alex, you know this well, is that the product is already unbundled in Brazil, right? So everybody's charging for seat assignment, you know, change fees, all of those things. It's already unbundled. But the primary reason is that, you know, Brazil, the burden is on the airlines. So I'll give you an idea. You know, Santos Dumont Airport in downtown Rio, many of you have flown into that airport. It closes on a pretty regular basis. I'd say once a week it closes. But when it closes, because God decided to shut the airport because of rain, fog, whatever it is, we're responsible to feed the passenger, access to internet, transportation, and a hotel night. Has absolutely nothing to do with us, right? And so you think about, you know, a ULCC that comes in and charges a very cheap fare, you know, one event in the San Simon Airport, and it's almost game over for that business model. The other in interesting thing about Brazil is it's a very litigious society. So we have about 3% of the world's flights, but we have 85% of the world's lawsuits. Azul was ranked as the most on-time airline four times this year, and we get 4,000 um, civil lawsuits a month, 
right? And so and, and you think about that for a second. And so you, know, you think about kind of more of a brash ULCC model that comes into Brazil and, and no, this is what it is. It's, you know, you know, it's just, it's, the market's not mature enough for that yet, right? And so we just had the ability to charge for, um, for bags. And then Congress went and took it away. And then the president vetoed it. And it's kind of that, that back and forth. And so I think that, you know, until, I'll tell another funny story. So during the pandemic, you know, the president of the country um, was at the airport, decides to board one of our aircraft just to say hi to people, right? And so, and he's not wearing a mask. And um, the pilot comes out of the cockpit, takes his mask off, takes a selfie with the, with the president of the country, okay? We get a multi-million reais fine because of that, right? And so, you know, these are these are things that you know, you know, Brazil's a difficult place, but there's a tremendous amount of opportunity still if you do it right. And you know, I told my wife we were moving to Brazil, and it would be a three-year journey, and I'm now on year 15, right? And so, you know, it takes time to kind of develop the market and to do what we're doing. And so, I think that pure ULCC model that you're starting to see in Chile and in, in Peru and in Colombia, Brazil's just not there yet. The legislation is not ready for it yet because of that. I mean, imagine you ran a, a, a very large ULCC. Can you imagine having an army of lawyers, you know, that have to go and, you know, it's interesting and, and where the lawsuits are is they're all spread out all over the country, right? So you can have some random judge in the middle of nowhere in Brazil that's taking a decision. And, you know, I joke that every bag we lose has a wedding dress in it, right? Because we get charged, you know, because that, that's, that's a type of, of kind of- And an you know, iPad. A, 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 a iPad, everything, you know, and so, but, but it's so, it's a, different, it's a different country. It doesn't mean that there's not opportunities because there's tremendous opportunities to grow the Brazilian market, and, but it's, it's uniquely different than the rest of Latin America for those reasons. That's interesting. In, in Vueling, we ended up having uh, two and a half resources for legal and then outsource uh, the rest. And we thought it was quite intensive, to be quite honest. <laughs> but okay, I'll take that number of so many thousand a month. That's yeah. uh, uh, really incredible. I, I guess the, the question that comes out of that is, can you charge a revenue premium to account for all of this? You have to, right? And, you know, and, and that's kind of what I tell you know, lawmakers in Brazil today. It's like the, the individuals that are, you know, are suing the airline today, who pays for that are all of the other customers. Right? And so it, it, it becomes more of an elitist kind of system in Latin America because only that top tier can afford to travel because all of that is in the cost structure. Right? And so every time we, we put a flight in, you have to have a cost structure in there for when the airport's closed, for the certain number of people that actually sue you. And so you'll see that. I mean, you know, Azul today has the highest fares in Brazil, you know, by far, right? And a lot of it's because we're, you know, monopolies and or we're the only carrier in about 80% of the routes that we fly because we fly to so many different cities. You know, our two main competitors, they fly what I call the triangle of Brazil. They fly Rio, Sao Paulo, Brazilia, and 92% of their seats always hit one of those three cities. For us, it's only 38%, right? And so we're kind of spread out more, you know, all throughout Brazil. But you, knew, you do need to have a revenue premium to do that. But what, where it hurts you, Alex, is that Brazilians travel less than Colombians. They travel less than Chileans. They travel less than Mexicans. Certainly travel a lot less than the people in the United States and, and, and in Europe. And, and so I think until you kind of attack you know, some of those other issues that you have, you know, you're, it's, it's gonna be hard to truly stimulate that, that market. That makes sense. I'm, I'm still stuck on, on the, uh, the revenue premium. Uh, and of course, you wouldn't be able to have a super low fare in which you waive your rights uh, in any way, <laughs> shape or form, right? I'm sure you've looked at this <laughs> to, to, try to not have to pay for that. Well, let's move on a, a little bit. Um, a few years ago, we uh, now quite a few years ago, um, we had the first big uh, South American uh, merger uh, between Lion and Town. And uh, that's been going on for some time, and they just come out of bankruptcy, et cetera, et cetera. But we now have another group of airlines that say that they're going to come together, and they even refer to them, uh, they refer to themselves as the IAG of South America. Um, I have a few comments about that, um, not for this meeting. I'd love uh, to hear them. No, yeah, not, not today. <laughs> but but uh, the reality is uh, that an investor base has decided that it was 
uh, worth it to come together, to pull forces together uh, commercially and otherwise. And of course, they've had a setback. Uh, Felix was going to join us today. He's unable to, to join us. Uh, in, in they had the setback in, in Colombia. Now, you yourselves, you have been forging relationships with other airlines from very simple, very early on interlines and then code shares to JVs to now equity. Well, that was a while ago, United, et cetera. Uh, does this go farther? Uh, is, there, is there a place in which uh, Azul at some point uh, comes together with others? Does it need to? You know, I'm, I don't think we need to, but I think if, you know, let, let's look at the U.S. market first and then maybe Europe and then, and then go back to Latin America. I mean, the, the U.S. carriers only became free cash flow positive when they went through M&A activity, right? And so that's what drove it. And it was domestic consolidation that drove airlines to be an investable asset, okay? And so, you know, when you talk about kind of cross-border and, you know, I, you're referring to kind of LAN and TAM kind of merging and, you know, I, you know they just went through bankruptcy, right, you know, a couple of years ago. So I'm not sure that cross-border consolidation is simple. And I'm not sure that it has the level of synergies that you get in pure domestic consolidation. So, you know, I'm an advocate for domestic consolidation. I think that's very healthy. I think you kind of connect two networks that have seven, 800 flights a day and have your revenue management teams together, you know, coordinating schedules. When you start talking about cross-border, especially in Latin America, you know, Brazilians love South Florida. Brazilians don't love Bogota, they don't love Santiago, they don't love Buenos Aires, they love South Florida, right? And so, you know, when you think about it, you know, there's not that many flights intra Latin America that touch Brazil. And so the level of synergies, and you, know, you think of a network, is when you can coordinate pricing and schedules through some sort of a JV or consolidation opportunity, and that's where the value is for investors. And I think that in the US, they learned that, and I think the US has done a really good job. And so when you ask me, hey, you know, what's of interest to us? Partnerships are always of interest. Anytime you can get feed, and you know, United Airlines has been a great partner of ours, JetBlue's a fantastic partner of ours, when we fly into Florida, but, how many truly, how many passengers are you truly connecting, right? Uh, you know, Azul next month will have just under a thousand flights a day, okay? And so our partner, United Airlines, they have five, six flights a day into Brazil. And how many of them are connecting beyond Sao Paulo, right? There's not that many, right? And when you're comparing, you know, an airline of our size that's going to carry 26 million passengers this year, it's just not that significant. But when you look at opportunities to connect, domestically through code shares, JVs, wow, now that gets really interesting and, and the ability to add a lot of value, you know, for all stakeholders, you know, you think about it, it it's really interesting as you go back and you look at the United States and you kind of say, hey, uh, you know, what's gonna happen when United and Continental get together? You know, or US Airways and American, there's gonna be, you know, all these people are gonna lose their jobs. These guys can't staff their airlines today. They simply cannot staff their airlines today, with all due respect to those of them that are here, right? Because they're getting new metal, they, they, they strengthen their balance sheets, and that strengthen of the balance sheet makes somebody want to grow, right? And I think that that's what's best for Latin America overall, is, is that type of consolidation drives an investable asset. You get your aircraft cheaper, and it provides, you know, you know surety of a job for the long term. We've seen so many you know, airlines start and go bust, start and go bust in Latin America. And, you know, for a pilot career in Latin America, that's a pretty devastating thing to always have to start out at the bottom of the, of the seniority list, right? And so, um, you know, so I'm, I'm very much in favor of things that can be done. Now, cross-border, it's hard for me to kind of see the synergy value that you get from that. And um, I'm asking the questions today, but um, um, there, there are some formulas when you look at some overall um, uh, items like fleet procurement or some big agreements in which being able to come together with others absolutely delivers immediate uh, great value if the process is well managed. And I've been part of that. And so there, there's some, but I, I, I see commercially how that can be slightly more, different, more difficult. Now, let's pick on a couple of things that you said. You mentioned aircraft on, on a couple of different times. There was a day in which you were single-isle airline, and all of a sudden, you weren't. And uh, is this related to South Florida? <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, how did you make that step, and how has it been to now have wide bodies? You know, it's really interesting. A lot of people say, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're flying number air aircraft, all of a sudden you have a, we actually got 330s before we got 320s, believe it or not, right? And so. And, and, and people say, why are you, why are you doing that? Because that's where our customers want to go, 
right? So every woman in Sao Paulo that gets pregnant wants to go to Florida. It's just that simple, right? Every iPhone that's purchased, that, 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 if you walk around Sao Paulo today and ask somebody, where'd you get your iPhone? Miami. Where'd you get your iPhone? Miami. Where'd you get your S7? I got it in Miami. You know, where'd you get your, your baby carriage? Oh, Miami, Miami, right? And so, you know, we see Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, they're just two other Brazilian cities. They just happen to be a little bit farther north. Right? And so, you know, Brazilians know South Florida better than they know a lot of their own country. Right? And so, you know, I'll give you an idea that, you know, Foz do Iguaçu, it's the, it's the most majestic falls that you can possibly imagine. And most Brazilians have been to Paris, but they've never been to Foz do Iguaçu. Right? And so it's just when you connect, like we do, 170 cities, we're aggregating demand from 170 different cities and taking them to South Florida, right? And we, we also fly into Lisbon, and I think it's, it's, it's just another part of, our, part of our network, right? And I think the big fear you have as a, as a small carrier, um, you know, now we're kind of getting to a, a little bit bigger, is that you, you let the international drive your whole business, and that hasn't happened with us, right? It's so sexy to think about wide body aircraft flying internationally, what's going to be your onboard product, what kind of meals you have, right? And so, but I've got 900 flights a day and only 15 of them are doing that type of stuff, right? And I think that's the big fear you have is that everybody wants to focus on this sexy part of the business, but it's the blocking and tackling and the nuts and bolts of the business, which is delivering 885 domestic flights a day that that's why we have those, right? So I have to fly a prop plane into the middle of the, the Midwest of Brazil in order to fill my wide body aircraft that's gonna to go to Europe tonight. And I think that's, you just can't lose focus on that. And I think that's really important. And uh, to, to, to that point, for example, do you allow many pictures of the premium product of the long haul show up in internal comms? Probably not, <laughs> right? Because you don't want people to be focused on that. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just amazing how much people wanna focus on that, right? And so, you know, when you're, you know, we, we've got 13,000 people that work for us, and how many of those people actually touch a wide body aircraft? Very few. Right? But yet, it's when, you, when you're meeting with your people, they want to talk about that, and, and, but you just can't make, you just cannot lose focus on running a great business. And you know, on, on that point, Alex, I, I think you know, one thing I wanted to kind of address is, you know, I joke with all of my U.S. counterparts that they're all subsidized airlines, right? Because the U.S. government came in and gave billions, of, and what drives me absolutely crazy is that I'm an American citizen and I pay taxes here, and so they all got, they all got part of my tax money, and Brazil, we've got, zero. We got no money at all, right? And so that was a very difficult thing during COVID, if you can imagine, really nine months, no revenue, and we had to survive. And so of those 13,000 people that work for Azul today, 11,716 of them took an unpaid leave of absence. For how long? Anywhere from three to six months. And that saved the airline. And so, you know, when you, when you sit down and you talk with a guy like Steve Hazy, and, and, you know, Steve is, is a legend in the business, you know, you're flying around in a global, and we have these guys that took an unpaid leave of absence. You have to help, right? And so, you know, I think it gave enormous credibility. And so when we got back online after, after stopping for as long as we did, our people are our true asset. And that's why with you know, many different fleet types, flying to 170 cities, we became the most on-time airline in the world, not Latin America, in the world, because it's, it's a people business. And I think that that's kind of, kind of crucial. And, and our people saw what it was like to go without pay for several months and the fear, right? And you know, we were like, is the government gonna help us? Is the government gonna help us? And I said, they're not there, right? Latin American countries do not have the resources that other countries have, and so we had to do things differently. I, I, I know the feeling of not getting uh, yeah. government, <laughs> government uh, uh, help and uh, 20 million pounds a day uh, burn rate. Uh, but, uh, but I was going to ask you about that. Um, having run an airline that only had one aircraft type with three variants, 19, 20, and 21 uh, Airbuses, um, moving then to an airline that had many different kinds of aircraft types, I immediately came into contact with the complexity. But yet, you're delivering fantastic on-time performance. Uh, what's, what's the magic potion here? Is, is it really the people? Is it the conviction that that plane has to leave on time regardless? How, how do you make that happen? You know, I, I think every pilot wants to fly the wide body, right? Every pilot wants to become a captain. Everybody wants to grow. And I think we, we, we instill in our people, the only way that we grow is if everything works, 
right? You only have a, a large aircraft because we have these small aircraft and you're, and you're kind of, the, the, the biggest complexity we have today at the airline is pilot training. It is a royal pain in the ass. It's very, very difficult. Every time a wide body shows up, the, you know, there's five different training events that are triggered by that, right? And we allow for the people to kind of grow and that's a huge, huge challenge for us. But everybody knows that it all has to work together, right? You, we, we are a connect airline. More than 65% of our customers connect on us on a daily basis, 65%, 65. right? And so there's a lot of, so if we don't run an on-time airline, imagine how many lawsuits we'd have, you know? And, and, and so it, it's kind of essential to who we are and everybody has to be aware of that. And, you know, and, and, you know, we tell our pilots is, look, if we can trim five minutes here, five minutes here, you know, that creates another aircraft for us to grow. And everybody kind of has to be on the same page because it, it is extremely complex to have, you know, uh, multiple fleet types. But Alex, you know this well, it's, it's also extremely expensive to fly the wrong aircraft in a market. And people forget that. You know, people think the largest cost an airline has is fuel. The largest cost an airline has is an empty seat because you'll never capture that again. And so many times airlines fly the wrong equipment type into certain markets. And so you know, we try to ensure that we always have the right equipment type into every, every market that we fly. Okay, a couple of good questions before we, we wrap it up. Um, COVID, you mentioned it very quickly. I guess my, my main question is, uh, after talking about that leave of absence between three and six months, incredible, 11,000 uh, people, are you better off uh, post COVID, where, where was that? A, did you have an opportunity to uh, look back, see what else you could do better? Were there, was there any process improvement? Any, um, do you feel that you're better off afterwards or still suffering the after effects? You, you know, it's interesting, I, Alex, I moved to Brazil 15 years ago. I hired my neighbor across the street, right? And he's a good guy and he served well at the company. But you know, for a couple of years, I was like, he's not really delivering like he should, you know? And, But when you're growing an airline always, growth hides fat. It's just, it's just a fact. But when you take an airline all the way down to its knees and you stop operating, you start to say, what is essential? What do I absolutely need to do? And so we built the airline back up and our call center today is 25% more efficient. Our airports are 20% more efficient. So that's being a more on-time airline today with, with less people across the board. So it's, it's the true technology that kind of came in and said, hey, how are we gonna do things better? How do we communicate better as an airline? And I think that that leave of absence that took place Everybody's like, shit, I went without a salary. If he's not pulling his weight, that's a problem, right? Because, you know, I don't want to suffer again. And so you kind of, you got the best of the best and people that are really committed to what you're doing. And, and I think, you know, for Latin America, you know, Azul is a great employer, right? And so I think in the United States and Europe, you know, people have a lot of different, you know, options. But, you know, today, Azul is, I think, the 45th largest company in all of Brazil, right? And it's only 15 years old. And so, but yeah, absolutely. We had to re-look at everything that we did and make sure that we built it back much better. Now, we obviously have more debt. We obviously have to kind of pay back our operating lessors that gave us kind of some time while we weren't operating. And so that's a burden. But I think every airline in the world is more levered today than they were when they, when they exited or when they, when, when they started COVID, right? And so, you know, we're, we've increased our leverage, but you know what? We're today, we're producing the same amount of EBITDA that we had in 2019. And our airline today is 44% larger in terms of revenue in the third quarter with less people. So think about that for a second. We're 44% larger in terms of absolute revenue compared to 2019 with less people on, on, on board. Now, obviously, fuel has gone up and you know, other costs have gone up. We've had a little bit of devaluation of the currency, but I think that shows that we built it back a lot stronger. Great, and it's an unfair uh, question to ask you in 30 seconds or less, but as you look at uh, growth, and we've spoken uh, markets, uh, partnerships, aircraft, et cetera, uh, role of technology, are you investing a lot in technology? Do you recognize that technology uh, can be one of those levers that can help you uh, uh, growth? Is that Absolutely. Present? You know, Alex, I, I had the experience of JetBlue. You had this at IAG as well. It's like, it's so easy to invest $40, 50000000 million in a new aircraft 
but we forget about technology, right? And so your CapEx every year is new aircraft, new metal, new metal, new metal, new metal, until all of a sudden you have a shitty operation and you say, what did I do, right? And so I think that you know the technology is the solution. And a lot of times, again, buying aircraft and talking to an air, a lessor or an OEM, it's sexy but the technology is really the backbone of your business and, and to make you more efficient. I know there's a lot of great technology providers that are here at this conference, but it's absolutely essential, right? Because you can't continue to grow an airline with just throwing more bodies at it. You know, the technology, and it's the right thing to do for all of your stakeholders. It's the right thing to do for your customers, your crew members, for your investors, right? You, you, know, you cannot grow an airline and be inefficient going forward. No, it's exciting, and I know that you're uh, investing and working on uh, a lot of innovation uh, projects, etc. Well, I'm super reinforced that this decision we made 10 years ago, that the best airline we could create should be a South American low-cost carrier that evolves in this model is the right thing. So thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you, Alex. Right. Thank you.